Today we're going to continue reading I Am Malala, the Young Reader's Edition. We are going to begin on page 32 with chapter 5, The First Direct Threat. Each morning as my friends passed through the gate to school, a man across the street stood scowling at us. Then one night he arrived at our home, along with six elders from the community. I answered the door. He claimed to be a mufti, or an Islamic scholar, and said he had a problem with the school. My father shooed me into the other room as this mufti and the elders crowded into our little house, but I heard every word. I am representing good Muslims, the mufti said, and we all think your girls' high school is a blasphemy. You should choose, you should close it. Teenage girls should not be going to school. They should be in Purda. This mufti was clearly under the influence of a Malana, who had been running an illegal radio broadcast through which he gave sermons and railed against people whom he deemed un-Islamic. What we knew, but the mufti did not, was that his own niece attended my father's school in secret. As my father debated with the mufti, one of the elders spoke up. I heard you were not a pious man, the man said to my father, but there are Qurans here in your home. Of course there are, my father said. I am a Muslim. The mufti jumped back into the conversation, complaining about girls entering the school through the same gate that men also used. So my father came up with a compromise. The older girls would enter through a different gate. Eventually, the mufti backed down and the men left. But even as the door shut behind them, I had a knot in my stomach. I had grown up watching stubborn, prideful Pashtun men. Generally, when a Pashtun man loses an argument, he never really forgets or forgives. Even though I was a child, I knew this man was mistaken. I had studied the Quran, our holy book, since I was five, and my parents sent me to a madrasa for religious studies in the afternoons when school finished. It was an open-air mosque where boys and girls studied the holy Quran together. I loved learning the Arabic alphabet. I loved the strange and mysterious shapes of the letters, the sounds of the prayers as we all recited together, and the stories about how to live a life according to the teachings of Allah. My teacher there was a woman. She was kind and wise. For me, the madrasa was a place for religious education only. I would go to the Kushal school for all my other studies. But for many of these children, the madrasa would be the only place they would ever study. They wouldn't take any other classes, no science, no math, no literature. They would study only Arabic so that they could recite the Holy Quran. They didn't learn what the words actually meant, though, only how to say them. I didn't think much of this difference until later after the mufti's visit to our house. One day, I was playing with the neighborhood children in the alley, and when we were choosing up sides for a game of cricket, one of the boys said he didn't want me on his team. Our school is better than yours, he said, as if that explained things. I didn't agree one bit. My school is the better one, I said. Your school is bad, he insisted. It is not on the straight path of Islam. I didn't know what to make of this, but I knew he was wrong. My school was heaven. Because inside the Kushal school, we flew on wings of knowledge. In a country where women aren't allowed out in public without a man, we girls traveled far and wide inside the pages of our books. In a land where many women can't read the prices in the markets, we did multiplication. In a place where as soon as we were teenagers, we'd have to cover our heads and hide ourselves from the boys who'd been our childhood playmates, we ran as free as the wind. We didn't know where our education would take us. All we wanted was a chance to learn in peace. And that is what we did. The crazy world could carry on outside the walls of the Kushal school. Inside, we could be who we were. Our only concerns once we dropped our school bags in the classroom were the same as any child's at school. 
who would get the highest grade on the day's test, and who would sit with whom at recess. It was a point of pride for me that almost every year in primary school, I won the trophy for first place at the end of the term. I was considered one of the top girls and the principal's daughter, and some girls thought maybe there was a connection between the two. But it was a point of pride for my father that he gave me no special treatment. And the proof was obvious to everyone when a new girl came to school when I was about nine. Her name was Malka Inor, and she was bright and determined. But I did not think she was nearly as clever as me, so on the last day of school that year when the awards were announced, I was stunned. She had gotten first place and I was second. I smiled politely as she received her trophy, but the minute I got home, I burst into tears. When my father saw me, he comforted me, but not in the way I wanted. It's a good thing to come in second, he said, because you learn that if you can win, you can lose. And you should learn to be a good loser, not just a good winner. I was too young and too stubborn to appreciate his words. And truth be told, I still prefer to be first. But after that term, I worked extra hard so I would never have to learn that particular lesson again. Another of my regular worries was whether Moniba was angry with me. She was my best friend, bookish like me, almost like my twin. We sat together whenever we could, on the bus, at recess, in the classroom, and she made me laugh as no one else could. But we had a habit of fighting and always over the same thing when another girl came between us. Are you my friend or hers? Moniba would say if I sat with another girl at recess. Moniba, I'd say. You were the one ignoring me. The worst part was when Moniba would refuse to talk to me. Then I would get angry at her for being so angry at me. Sometimes these spats would last for days. Eventually, I would miss her too much and I would take responsibility for the fight. I seemed to always take the blame. Then she would make a funny face and we'd fall apart laughing and forget our differences. Until the next time another girl came between us. How could a place where I learned so much and laughed so much be bad? 